Hi everyone, my name is Emma and I'm a patient advocate with the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation. Thank you for joining us on today's educational webinar. Whitney Christie is the outpatient dietitian for Mary Washington Healthcare's Regional Cancer Center in Fredericksburg, Virginia. She is a certified specialist in oncology and nutrition support. She has practiced for 15 years, the majority of the time in oncology. She participates in research, quality improvement, and outreach projects and serves on multiple clinical teams for the cancer program. Whitney cares for patients with all types of cancer and describes her approach to cancer care as individualized. She believes that each patient has unique nutritional needs. She believes her role is to provide nutritional care that positively impacts treatment outcomes and improves quality of life during one of the most challenging times in a person's life. Whitney received a Bachelor of Science in Food and Nutrition from West Virginia University in 2004. She completed her combined internship and Master of Science in Nutrition at Case Western Reserve University and University Hospitals of Cleveland in 2006. Whitney is an active member of the Oncology Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group and received the Oncology Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group's 2021 Distinguished Practice Award. Whitney speaks on tube feeding in the home setting, blenderized tube feedings, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, head and neck cancer, and increasing fruit and vegetable consumption. She is comfortable speaking to both professional and lay audiences. Whitney resides in King George, Virginia with her husband and two children. She enjoys yoga, supporting the arts and describes herself as a self-proclaimed nutrition nerd. We welcome you to place your questions in the chat throughout Whitney's presentation and I will read them aloud after she is finished. Um, just a reminder to please keep your questions general and not personalized to your medical care. Over to you, Whitney. Thanks, Emma, for that introduction, and thanks to the Calangio Carcinoma Foundation for having me on today. So today I'm going to talk to you about nutrition and cholangiocarcinoma uh, the, with a focus on the new uh, cholangiocarcinoma nutrition and cholangiocarcinoma booklet that CCF has um, introduced. And then I'm also going to go through some frequently asked questions that were identified by the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation and also uh, ones uh, identified by myself or one identified by myself um, just to give you some more information on nutrition. So a little bit about myself. Um, I am actually one of the co-authors of the Nutrition and Cholangiocarcinoma Patient Education Booklet. I have been a cancer dietitian for 15 plus years. Uh, I work in the outpatient setting and I do work in Fredericksburg, Virginia at the uh, Mary Washington Healthcare Regional Cancer, Center, uh, Regional cancer Center and I'm the sole dietitian there. And I'm also a member of the Oncology Dietetic Practice Group. And that's basically a group, um, it's a subgroup of the Academy of Nutrition and dietetics where uh, practitioners who are interested in oncology um, participate in this group on many different initiatives. And the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation booklet is just one of them. And then I'm also board a board certified specialist um, in oncology nutrition. And I also have another certification uh, which is a certified nutrition support uh, clinician. And that is a certification for working with individuals uh, who, have, who are on TPN or tube feedings. So a little bit about the project. So this actually started, the process for this book, uh, patient education booklet started in 2020. Uh, the Carlangio Carcinoma Foundation approached the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the in the, uh, the Oncology DPG or Dietetic Practice Group. And the Oncology Dietetic Practice Group then put out a call to all of its members uh, to see if there was any interest related to this project. And I was, again, one of the four uh, oncology dietitians who was selected for the project. 
and a little bit more about this project. Um, you can see here that there's a lot of people who came to the table for this project. Um, you can see that there were sponsors here uh, that are listed here, and then the authors are listed here too. So this was actually my first experience um, writing uh, this this type of booklet, um, and it was it was a great experience uh, to have. And we had, there were lots of people. Um, that worked on this project. Again, virtually this was done because this was you know, in the height of COVID. Uh, so the dietitians that uh, wrote this booklet uh, met virtually and then there were meetings between the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation on many different occasions with the dietitians and other um, players uh, with writing this booklet. And I have to say that writing was just a small portion of you know, this booklet being released. Um, so, and again, it, it was great to be a part of this experience. The next uh, page that I'm showing you here is actually how to access the new book, the Nutrition and Cholangiocarcinoma booklet. It's actually available on the Cholangiocarcinoma uh, Foundation's page. Uh, and it's actually available in PDF for hard copy form, and it is a free resource. So, and I actually have my booklet with me today. Um, it's about 150 pages, um, and it is, you know, geared towards uh, patients. So um, it's more in, you know, lay, layman's terms. And then just to go a little bit more uh, into what this booklet was about, I was, wanted to go through the different sections of the booklet just to show you kind of how this, just to give you some pieces of information about how this booklet was la is laid out and some of the sections, just so you know what you're getting into and what you're getting when you get this booklet. Um, so there's an introductory section, and that's basically the section that talks about um, cholangiocarcinoma, and then um, it discusses the role that the bile duct play plays in normal digestion and nutrient absorption. And then it also discusses the different types of cholangiocarcinoma. And then the next section is the nutrition and cholangiocarcinoma section. So this uh, basically is a section that's going over general information and the importance of eating well, and then also the role of the registered dietitian. Um, and I also want to point out uh, that I know that there are various changes that are happening um, in your body related to cholangiocarcinoma and also its treatment. So I think something too that should be pointed out here is that you are unique and your nutritional needs are not the same as, you know, somebody else who has cholangiocarcinoma or someone in your family, um, even before you've had cholangiocarcinoma. Just know that your nutritional needs are unique um, and you may not have, again, the same nutritional needs, um, you know, as, as somebody, you know, that you are, you're speaking to. And it never ceases to amaze me the strength that patients have going through, through treatment. So I just want to put that out there too. And then the next section that we're going to go into is actually a section that explains what a registered dietitian is. So yes, I'm a registered dietitian, um, and it's important to point out that all dietitians are nutritionists, but not every nutritionist is a dietitian. So that's something also important to point out that typically if you want kind of a, a more of a valid uh, source of uh, information, you want to speak with a registered dietitian. And a dietitian, um, another Another group of dietitians uh, is a CSO, which is a certified specialist in oncology. And that's a dietitian who has completed at least 2000 hours uh, with oncology patients and has passed a certification exam. And there is also information in this booklet about how to find a dietitian or a certified specialist on oncologies. And there's recommendations and links provided throughout uh, the booklet. And I also just want to say that another way to find a dietitian is talk to your provider about this. So whether it be an oncologist, whether it be a surgeon, ask them a question about whether they have dietitians, you know, available for you to see. I work for a hospital that, you know, that I get many patients that are referred to me. So, and, and my services are actually free too, which is, uh, you know, a great thing that I that I like about my job is that there is access to a dietitian. So that's another important thing um, just to point out that sometimes these services are actually available to you for free. 
And then the next uh, part of this is actually an introduction to an organization called the American Institute for Cancer Research. So this section here introduces the American Institute for Cancer Research and they are a great re resource. Um, they have a great website with lots of great information in it. This section is going to review cancer prevention recommendations and those extend into survivorship. Um, and just to mention some other resources uh, that American Institute for Cancer Research has uh, that you may want to look at is they have this cancer health check where you can actually, it's an interactive quiz where you can go in and enter information about yourself and it'll give you feedback on things that you may need to um, do to improve the quality of your diet. So that's another great thing that they have. Um, so a lot of great resources again with this, this um, organization. And then the next section that we're going to get into goes over general nutrition guidelines. Uh, this section introduces the new American plate, which is a plate model um, that shows how to eat healthy. Uh, it, so that's one thing to point out with this section, and it discusses building your plate. So just to explain what the new American plate is, it is actually developed by the American Institute for Cancer Research. It's a plate model that shows how to build your plate where two thirds of your plate is going to be plant-based foods. Um, and and then a third of it is going to be some type of protein. Um, and I describe those as a, that that is a high quality protein. So, um, and also what's important to mention here is as you're going through treatment, you may have nutritional struggles and obstacles. Um, so don't always think that your plate has to look a certain way. A lot of times you have to make modifications with the foods that you're eating because of side effects that you may uh, experience because of cholangiocarcinoma or its treatments. The next section is describing uh, goals of cancer treatment or, or goals of nutrition care during cancer treatment. So this section is gonna discuss short and long-term goals for nutrition. And again, it acknowledges that each person who is experiencing cancer is unique and has unique nutritional needs. Um, and I think that that's, um, you know, getting information from others. I know a lot of times people do try to help and give you nutritional information, but I think that's what's great about seeking out a registered dietitian is when you're sitting one-on-one -on -one with that registered dietitian, they really are focused on you and your unique, unique nutritional needs and finding what works for you. The next section of this booklet is talking about malnutrition in the setting of cancer. So again, having cholangiocarcinoma or going through the treatments for cholangiocarcinoma, um, there are different things that can happen with your nutrition. Uh, you could have weight loss. Um, you could have changes in the way that you're eating. You may notice that the composition or your muscle mass or body fat might be different than it was prior to having cancer because you might may be debilitated because of cancer or its treatment. So this is just a section, again, that talks about malnutrition, um, acknowledges uh, it, and then also talks about markers of malnutrition. And then there's also weight loss and cachexia uh, sections. Um, and there is, uh, there's also a chart within this section that reviews what significant weight loss um, would look like based on different weights. The next part of this section, um, this was, uh, a great idea that we decided to put in here is information for the caregivers. So oftentimes when you're going through uh, treatment, you know, it's not just a one person battle. A lot of times there are multiple people that are involved. So this section just acknowledges and discusses the importance of the caregiver's role um, in nutrition. So just another section uh, again of this booklet. And then we get into a little bit more information that's a little bit more detailed uh, where we're going to talk about nutrition after different procedures that you may have because of cholangiocarcinoma. One of these treatments uh, would be a duodenal stent placement. So a duodenal stent, for those of you who may not know, is a hollow tube that is placed um, in your intestines to open a blocked area and allow for normal passage of food and liquids. So what's recommended for duodenal stent placement is a soft, low fiber diet with easy to chew and swallow foods to prevent that stent from getting blocked or dislodged. This section also has a post stent diet chart that features foods that are recommended and foods that are not recommended. Um, so you can clearly identify the foods that would be right for your diet after this procedure. There are also 
many surgeries uh, that can happen because of cholangiocarcinoma. And we decided to compile sections that had nutrition after surgical procedures. Um, just to kind of mention uh, some things about surgical procedures. These are general nutrition tips. Um, your uh, surgeon may have specific nutrition tips too, but these are general nutrition tips based on the types of procedures that were identified um, as ones that are you know, associated with cholangiocarcinoma. So, uh, this particular one that we're looking at right now is the cholecystectomy, um, and it is a low-fat diet that's typically recommended after that procedure. So there are general recommendations on a low-fat diet, which is a 40 to 50 gram uh, fat diet. Uh, and basically this diet is used to control symptoms of bloating, gas pain, diarrhea, and malabsorption um, from this procedure. You're also gonna see uh, foods and snack ideas, because um, a lot of times, when you are recovering from surgery, you may not be able to eat the capacity or the amount at meals as you once normally were. So there are some suggestions for those in between foods and snacks. And there's even sample meal plans within uh, this booklet in the different surgery sections that are specific to the type of surgery. So again, those are meal plans. Um, they have a certain amount of you know, calories, protein um, to meet your nutritional needs. And then the next section that we're looking at is uh, nutrition after surgery for a liver transplant. Uh, so this section goes over general recommendations after liver transplant as far as nutrition. It also goes over food safety, which is of utmost importance um, after liver transplant because of your immune compromise. Uh, medication interactions are also reviewed in this section. So uh, one thing to point out is um, there is a low potassium uh, section that is that is here, and that's basic specifically related to cyclosporin and tacrolismus. And the low potassium section has charts that are listed that has high potassium foods, which are 350 milligrams or, or above, medium potassium foods, and then low potassium foods, which are 150 milligrams per serving. Um, and then there's also additional information on side effect management, like fluid retention, diarrhea, changes in appetite, high blood, high blood sugar, and potassium. The next section that uh, we're gonna review is the Whipple diet information. So as you can see here, there is one of those sample meal plans that I was talking about with the cholecystectomy um, that you can see that's, that's nicely laid out. And again, it has the amount of calories, protein, fat, and fiber that it provides. So this section goes over general recommendations after your, after your Whipple procedure. Uh, what's listed within this section is low fiber diet information. So there's a chart with foods recommended and not recommended. It also has examples of low fiber snacks and small meal ideas. And there is also a sample meal plan as you see here in that section. The next section uh, in this booklet is the nutrition support section. So nutrition support is defined as an alternate means of nutrition other than eating. So you may have something like a feeding tube placed after a surgical procedure. You may have a feeding tube placed if you're not eating enough or malnourished. And then there's also a form of nutrition that's known as TPN uh, or total parenteral nutrition. Uh, I typically refer to it with patients as I IV nutrition, um, where there's some type of issue within your digestive tract, um, where you're going to be put on a method of nutrition that basically bypasses uh, digestion. So there's a lot of different tips in this section about um, enteral nutrition and parenteral nutrition. The next section is about malabsorption and pancreatic enzymes. So as we presented before, there are some surgical procedures um, that can lead to malabsorption like a Whipple procedure. Um, and malabsorption is is also known uh, in, in this sense as what's called exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And basically what that means is your pancreas plays an important role in digestion. It puts out enzymes that help digesting primarily the fat in your foods. And when there is any type of disruption, surgical procedure um, that can disrupt, again, the flow of those enzymes or even the output of those enzymes. So this section discusses 
causes of malabsorption. Um, and it also talks about signs and symptoms such as gas, bloating. Um, some people even have issues where they might be running to the bathroom quickly after they eat. And it discusses the treatment for exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, which is basically taking prescription uh, pancreatic enzymes. So in terms of pancreatic enzymes, the information that's presented there, um, there's you know a, a lot of things that go into pancreatic enzymes. Again, they're a prescription, so you have to take them a certain way with your foods. There's side effects. There's a tube feeding section for individuals that might be on pancreatic enzymes and tube feeding. And then there's also sections on financial considerations uh, with pancreatic enzymes. So say you had an issue with your insurance covering for your pancreatic enzymes, there are, uh, there's information within the booklet that is presented that goes over, again, ways to ease the financial burden of pancreatic enzymes if that is an issue. The next section is a pretty big section. Um, it talks about the nutritional management of side effects of cancer treatment. Uh, so this section has a lot of sections in it that go over, again, specific side effects that can happen because of cancer or because of its treatment. So as you can see here, there are sections on poor appetite, increasing calories and protein in your diet, examples of high protein, high calorie snack ideas, uh, nutritional tips for nausea and vomiting, nutritional tips for constipation, nutritional tips for diarrhea, dry mouth, taste and smell changes. And then there's even more uh, nutritional tips, uh, such as tips for sore mouth or throat, um, should you have any effects, say with chemotherapy causing mouth sores, oral thrush, which is a type of fungal infection you can get during cancer treatment um, or because you have a you know, co compromised immune system, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, gas bloating, lactose intolerance, cold sensitivities, which can happen because of a certain type of chemotherapy, fatigue, iron deficiency, and high phosphorus levels. Um, and one thing that I think is awesome is this high phosphorus levels. You can see the information here um, that was put within this booklet um, on hyperphosphatemia. Uh, the reason that this was put in the cholangiocarcinoma booklet, nutrition booklet, is because of genetic testing and the FGFR2 mutation and the target therapies that can cause high phosphorus. So within this section, you're going to see um, tips for reducing phosphorus in your diet, food lists. Um, so again, something that's uh, specific to cholangiocarcinoma um, and the genetic testing and FGFR2 mutation and the targeted therapies uh, that are given for that. Food safety is also presented a section within this. So again, as we reviewed before, that can be uh, important because of uh, liver transplant and immunosuppressants that you may be on. And this is important too during uh, cancer treatment. Uh, I mean, it's important at any time, but because your immune system can be compromised, you wanna just make sure that you're taking uh, extra caution preparing your foods. So four basics of food safety are to clean, separate, cook, and chill. Um, and again, a lot of information within this section on food safety. There is also a section that's on oral supplements. Uh, and this is basically, uh, you know, nutritional shakes, commercial nutritional shakes, commercial powders, um, you know, different types of, of things that patients who may have cholangiocarcinoma may use during their treatment for various reasons. You may choose to use nutritional shakes because you're not eating that well. You may choose to use nutritional shakes because you're trying to get an extra protein as you're recovering from surgery. You may use nutritional shakes uh, because your doctor suggested it. So again, the information here is just on some types of nutritional shakes um, and powders, and it even splits the nutritional uh, the nutritional products up into different sections. So if you're looking for higher calorie nutritional shakes, that is one section that's in here. If you're looking for just high protein nutritional shakes, that's in there. There's also specialty nutritional shakes. So say you do have 
diabetes, maybe you have um, end-stage renal disease, there's information on nutritional shakes that would work well for those. Uh, juice drinks, uh, those are kind of a newer thing. These are clear liquid protein drinks that are out there. And then add-ins. And an example of an add-in would be something like a protein powder that you would mix in with your food or maybe mix in with a nutritional shake. The next section is on complementary and alternative medicine. So this section basically discusses complementary and alternative treatments. And there's also QR codes within this section and links for more information on this. The next section is on vitamin and mineral supplementation. So vitamin and mineral supplementation is listed within this section, and there's also QR codes and links for supplement safety. Uh, and I also, and I also, I'm going to say, if you're on any vitamins or minerals, uh, please talk to your healthcare team about the ones that you're taking. Um, sometimes there can be interactions, or your physician may prefer you not to take those during treatment. Um, an example of that is I work in a radiation department, also with in my role, um, and we do not like patients to take um, high dose antioxidants when they're getting radiation treatment. Um, so I think it's important to share again with your provider or your healthcare team the vitamins and minerals that you are taking. There is also a great section within this booklet that has recipes that were developed specifically for this booklet by one of the dietitians that worked on this project with myself. Um, so there are low fat, low fiber recipes. Um, some of the examples of the recipes that are within this booklet are recipes for fajitas, soups, egg salad, overnight oats, smoothies. So a lot of different variations there. And then oral rehydration solution recipes are also presented. So oral rehydration solutions are basically um, drinks that you drink if you are severely dehydrated, maybe you suffer from diarrhea, they can help replace and replete some of those electrolytes and the fluids that you lose um, a little bit more effectively than something like a, you know, a standard sports drink. Uh, so, and then, and again, there are ways that you can make oral rehydration solutions with, um, with things that you may already have in your kitchen. The next section uh, is the resources section. So this section basically lists uh, credible organizations and websites um, and information about uh, those organizations with links. We also thought it would be nice to put a section in here that was geared towards cookbooks. I get a lot of questions from my patients about cookbooks that might be geared towards cancer or its treatments. Um, so again, this has a lot of just different ideas for cookbooks that you might want to um, either purchase or another tip for cookbooks is I've found them in some of these within my local library. So if you wanted to go to your local library and look for any of these cookbooks, that's also another idea. And then finally, because not everybody talks medical talk, we have a glossary section. So within this booklet, if you see anything that's highlighted, um, we have a glossary section that basically gives you definitions for some of these more complex terms that are used throughout the booklet. Um, and then we have a references section. So these are all the references, including, you know, websites and, um, you know, papers, books that we use to compile this nutrition booklet. And some other really cool things about this booklet, there's, you can take notes. Um, it, within the booklet, there's QR codes that you can scan with your phone. And then there's also hyperlinks um, that you can click on. So again, a lot of, of great um, work and thought put into this booklet. So now we're gonna go into some frequently asked questions. So the first question that was brought up um, or discussed as something that might need to be spoke about during this webinar is actually a question that I would say I get every day from patients. Um, and that question is, does sugar feed cancer? So why does, why does cancer glow on a PET scan? That basically is a representation of the hyperactivity of cancer cells that is detected. All cells need sugar in the form of glucose to generate energy, cancerous or not. So you can't control which cells get sugar and which do not. 
And if we don't pr provide our body with enough carbohydrates, our body is going to be forced to make it. And that process can result in muscle loss, and it can also result in a de decreased immune function. So typically when I have patients that ask this question, I try to explain that to them. And then I also talk to them about you know, what healthy sugars are. If you're learning to, if you're wanting to clean up your diet, that's great. Um, you know, but I don't think that you should take away things that have sugar in your diet that are, you know, healthy form naturally occurring sugars, like things that might be present in fruits. Uh, so I typically talk to people about added sugars. So an example of an added sugar would be you know, adding sugar to the tea that you're drinking, or um, maybe something that you bought at the store that's processed or prepared, like some type of sugary breakfast cereal might is going to have added sugars to it. Um, and I also try to talk about naturally occurring sugars. And again, talking about, you know, the new American plate, plant-based eating, and just because something uh, has sugar in it, like a fruit, that does not mean that it is not a healthy food and something that should be included in your diet. The next question is, should I try keto, intermittent fasting, or, or a vegan diet? So these are questions that come up a lot. And some of these diets are ones that, you know, we've, we see a lot, or we see a lot of foods that are out there geared towards these diets, or we may hear people talking about these diets and they've been on them, or they heard that it was good to do keto for cancer. So my first tip would be talk to your dietitian or talk to your um, healthcare team talk to uh, a medical professional. So basically, and I'm going to review with you the three different types of diets that are listed here. So keto, intermittent fasting, and a vegan diet, and then just some points about those diets. So basically the keto diet is tying into that sugar feeding cancer rationale that I just presented. So this diet is a high fat diet. Uh, it has moderate protein in it, and it's very low in carbohydrates. So it reduces the amount of glucose that's going to be made available to your cells. And another thing to mention about the keto diet is there are so many different types of keto diet. Um, I learned so much from my patients, and I've had, even had patients who've educated me on some of the different uh, ketogenic diets that are out there. Um, so one form of them, the standard version is going to be 90% fat, 8% protein and 2% carbohydrates. There's also a modified version that's 80% fat, 15% protein and 5% carbohydrates. And carbohydrate containing foods are basically going to be avoided on this diet. So grains, fruits, milk, sugar, sweets. You can also have side effects from this diet that would include nausea, vomiting, being tired, um, things that can happen to your digestive system. Also, it can increase your cholesterol. So one thing too about the keto diet is if you do look at some of those recommendations for cancer prevention and survivorship, you know, you're eating things on this diet that have high amounts of fat in them and may not be the highest quality um, types of food like processed meat, for example. Um, another thing that it can happen because of a keto diet, it can cause renal damage, kidney stones, bone mineral loss. And I also want to point out that there's nothing specific to cholangiocarcinoma with these diets. Um, they, there has been thought that the ketogenic diet can reduce tumor growth and improve survival in patients with certain types of brain cancer. Um, but that's all that really has been figured out. So there, and there, there continue to be studies on this diet and all of these diets. Um, so as that information um, comes forward, we learn a little bit more about these diets as well. Um, so research again continues on this diet. And again, prior to implementation, I would really seek advice from your doctor or your medical team, or even going a step further and talking to a registered dietitian. Let's go on to intermittent fasting next. Um, so intermittent fasting has come up in the past maybe five years. Uh, and this is basically a type of diet where you're going to consume little or no foods for a specific period of time. Uh, this can range from 24 hours to six days. Um, you could do 16 to 48 hours with inter intervening periods of normal food intake. And just like the ketogenic diet, there's different types of intermittent fastings. You can have five days of typical ener energy consumption followed by two days 
uh, of 500 or fewer calories. And yes, this, this diet has shown some results with weight loss, improved insulin sensitivity, cardiovascular improvements, and also anti-inflammatory benefits. And there's also possible anti-cancer, anti the possible anti-cancer effects are likely because of enhanced oxidative stress and DNA damage during the short-term fasting on those cancer cells. And this uh, basically all things except water are excluded when you're fasting on this diet. So you also want to make sure that your body is nourished. And this diet could cause issues with malnutrition. It could also cause issues with loss of muscle mass. So those are important things to point out. Um, and then short-term weight loss has been shown in those who are obese or overweight. I don't know that we have a lot of long-term studies uh, on this diet. So a lot of the information, again, is short-term. Um, and there is some information that has come out about short-term fasting and possibly improving chemotherapy treatments, the efficacy of them, but those would be limited to the chemotherapy agents of cisplatin, cyclophosphamide, and doxyrubicin. And some animal mo models show no trend in improved survival with intermittent fasting in, in cancer patients. Um, so research continues, uh, shorter periods of fasting may be beneficial um, if you are doing intermittent fasting. And I also wanna say if you're diabetic, I would really caution using this diet because of the increased risk of low blood sugars or hypoglycemia. And again, talk to your dietitian or talk to your medical team um, about this is, if this is something that you want to learn more about. Vegan diet. Uh, so just, just a story. A couple months ago, I got a, a referral from a doctor uh, and they wanted me to talk to their patient about a vegan diet because this patient had transitioned to a vegan diet because of the health benefits that this patient felt the vegan diet had. Um, and I'm not sure if they wanted me to tell the patient that they shouldn't be on a vegan diet. Um, but before I even met with the patient, I said, you know, let me just, you know, there's lots of people that follow vegan diets. Um, people may follow them for health reasons. They may follow it for religious reasons, philosophical reasons, ethical reasons. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that their nutritional needs can't be met. So I would say out of the three diets that's presented here, there is more information on the vegan diet uh, and the health benefits that it can provide. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to be a vegan because I'm presenting you know, positive information on this diet. Just know that there are some healthy things and positives with this diet. So basically a vegan diet is where you're not eating any type of flesh foods or meats, any dairy foods or eggs. So it is a restrictive diet. So that's also something important to consider if you're going through cancer treatment is that you are excluding foods from your diet. Um, and again, you might may, may um, you know, put yourself at risk for malnutrition or not getting the nutrition that you need because you are excluding foods. Um, it does include a lot of healthy foods in it. So there's vegetables, fruits, whole grains, soy products, nuts, and seeds. Um, and I would say some benefits um, are that they are finding that people who follow vegan diets have lower body mass index and they may have less cancer risk. And another thing is that the gut microbia might be, health, might, may be healthier in vegans and they may have less inflammation, which may, you know, be anti-cancer, um, it may be an, a cancer, anti-cancer type of thing. And then this also, um, a vegan diet has, there's a high, a healthy eating index, um, which basically shows, uh, you know, how high quality your diet and there is, and it has a higher healthy eating index score. Um, and the Mediterranean diet score is also healthy for a vegan, is also higher for a vegan diet. Uh, but there are some things that that need to be considered if you are following this type of diet. You do have an increased risk of a B12 deficiency. So you need to supplement. Um, that needs to be supplement. So 50% or more um, needs to be supplement in terms of with vegetarians. It also, you can be a low, at high risk for having some type of deficiency of vitamin D, iron, zinc, calcium, and iodine. Um, and you may also have a need, you may also be deficient in protein and that's because you're taking meat out of your diet. So supplements may be needed uh, with this type of diet. 
Um, and a lot of people use things like iodized salt and uh, sea vegetables to meet those iodine needs and also the dietary reference intake or the recommendation for iron in this diet is 1.8 times higher for vegetarians and vegans. And the reason that this could reduce and uh, decrease risk of cancer is because it is a healthy diet. Um, and it also has mechanisms that we see like less meat intake, so less processed meat intake, less red meat intake, um, which can down regulate insulin like growth factor. One thing to point out about this diet that I, you know, learned in preparing for this presentation was there was actually a study uh, called the Adventist Health Study 2, and it showed that there was a 14% reduction in all cancers in vegans versus non-vegetarians. And also there was a 73% increase in the risk for urinary tract cancer in, in, in vegans. So I thought that that was interesting as well. I'd never heard that stat before. So these diets all need to be, including the vegan diet needs to be nutritionally balanced and adequate and reap health benefits. Um, and the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics um, actually has a position paper out on this, uh, this topic, the vegan diet, and it is a positive uh, position paper. The next question that was presented was, should I drink alkaline water or eat alkaline foods? And the reason that some feel that this diet uh, can help uh, is because this, the, the thought here is that this diet changes the body's pH to the alkaline range needed to fight disease and stay healthy. And in terms of cancer, the proposed thought here is that cancer cells thrive in an acidic environment or that cancer can result from improper food combinations. And there's various versions, versions also of this type of diet. Um, one encourages plant-based diet, a plant-based diet, excluding meats, sugars, and processed foods. And this can definitely be advantageous if you're eating less meat, sugars, and processed food, because you are eating healthier. Um, and that can lead to a lower incidence of cancer. Uh, and this, this particular diet has 80% of alkaline foods. So that's gonna be things like vegetables, low sugar fruits, uh, beans and legumes. And then there's a 20% acid forming foods. So beef, poultry, dairy foods, eggs, coffee, sugar, alcohol. And it even goes into like these strict protocols where there's like all these different levels of the alkaline uh, restrictive diet. Um, so again, those restrictive diets aren't necessarily the best in terms of, you know, improving the overall quality of your diet. Uh, and a lot of times these restrictive diets can lead to getting in less nutrition, so less calories, less protein, and they can also contribute to nutrient deficiency, deficiencies. So at this time, there is no data to support um, the use of, you know, restricting alkaline containing foods or, or eating alkaline containing foods or, or drinking alkaline waters. Um, and another thing to point out here is food does not change um, the pH of your blood. The alkaline diet may change the pH of your urine, but not, P not the pH within your body. Your kidneys do a great job of maintaining the pH balance when they're functioning normally. Um, so again, speak with a registered dietitian if you do want more information on this diet. And this was a uh, topic that I threw in here just because we hear a lot about plant-based burgers. Um, and I wanted to review this just because there, again, there's a lot, there's a lot of plant-based burgers out there. Um, and the question here is, tell me about plant-based burgers. Are they good for me? So basically plant-based burgers, um, there's lots of options out there now. You can even find them in you know, various types of restaurants um, and they're made from plant-based foods. Uh, they can fit into a healthy diet, but just because they say plant-based does not mean that they are healthy. Uh, a lot of times these burgers can actually contain a lot of uh, ingredients and they can be ultra processed. Um, and they may actually be more processed than the um, than some of the burgers that they're going up against or just, you know, making your own hamburger at home. Um, so just think about that. And uh, even the, the ingredients uh, that are in them can often be high, that are used to process them can be high in sodium and also high in saturated fat. Um, so label reading is a good way to, you know, see if you can pick out a good plant-based burger. Um, 
And, I, and another method that I just wanted to go back to here, and I know we talked about it earlier, was using the new American plate um, as a model for eating healthier and having more of a plant-based diet. And you can still have meat within that, um, with that, within that diet model as well. And that is it. I just wanted to, again, put more information up here on how to access the new book, Nutrition and Cholangiocarcinoma. So you can see here, here's the, the web link. And thank you for having me today. Thank you, Whitney. That was very informative. I learned a lot. Um, we have a few questions. One is, what are your thoughts on CBD or THC to help with appetite? Is this something that could be helpful? That would be another question where I'd probably gear you to talk to your uh, oncologist um, or medical professional. So um, it is a topic that comes up a lot. And one thing that I have to say is even in the area that I work in, um, we have a oncology practice that we work closely with and they've started talking more about this topic. So, um, I would say again, to talk to your medical professional about um, that, but yes, there can actually be some benefits with those. Yeah, and I apologize if some of these are a little too personalized, but I'm just gonna read them. That's okay. Can. Okay. Um, how to get a patient to eat nothing. If, if something doesn't taste good, what are your recommendations on getting a patient to eat it? Like maybe, because from chemo and stuff. Oh yeah, sure. So taste there. changes. Yeah. Yeah. So first I'll point you, there's, there's a great section in this booklet that goes over taste changes, but there's a lot of different things that you can do for taste changes. And I would say that that's probably one of the most frustrating things that uh, individuals deal with that are going through cancer treatments. Um, so first of all, there's a lot of different taste changes that can occur with cancer treatments. Some people may, may have metallic taste that they taste. Some people may think that things taste salty, bitter, too sweet. Um, one thing I often recommend to my patients is uh, excellent oral care or mouth care. So there's baking soda and salt rinses that you can do before you eat to help with cleansing your mouth. Um, another thing is uh, citrus or lemon flavored foods. Um, those a lot of times are a little bit more vibrant. Um, so they have a better taste than other foods. So incorporating foods or pickled foods um, into what you're eating. Uh, one thing about like salt, like if you're tasting things that are taste too salty, kind of dumb that down with some sweetness, maybe some honey. Um, and the reverse is also true. If foods taste like they're too sweet to you, you can add a little bit of salt to them. Um, and another thing that I really encourage, I would say this is probably one of my go-tos is just talking to people about trying new foods and paying attention to foods that are working or tasting well for you and even building off of maybe those flavors or those foods and adding more of those to the diet. Um, I think observation um, is, is a great way to help with maximizing nutrition, whether that be your observation or your family members' observations. Um, and you know, it's frustrating because because we all are used to eating a certain way our whole lives. And then you're thrown into cancer treatment and you, you don't know how to eat because your tastes have changed. So again, I think it's good to explore different types of food. I think oral care um, is great too. And even check it out some of those cookbooks. Um, they have a lot of great ideas too that may be geared towards taste changes. A good question. And like I said, very frustrating that one is. Um, I think you answered these, but maybe they hopped on late. Um, what about natural sugars like stevia added to coffee or tea? I think those are fine. Yeah. Um, I'll even take that kind of even a step further um, and say like even with stevia, you can actually grow stevia in your garden um, just to even take that, like I said, just a step further in terms of healthiness, but you can grow it. We grew it um, at my house and you can you can dry it and then pulverize it into like a powder. Um, and that can be used in things like teas, but yeah, I don't, I, I don't have a problem with, with any of anything like stevia now. Um, what causes bloating? What causes bloating? Uh, there can be a lot of things that <laughs> cause bloating. So, um, you know, one thing that we talked about that might be specific to cholangiocarcinoma is uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, um, which is where the pancreatic enzymes aren't 
being put out properly. So that can cause issues with bloating, um, you know, even just not being as active, you can have issues with bloating types of foods. So there's gas producing foods. Um, and that's within the booklet too, is some sections that talk about gas producing foods. So I would say if you're having issues with bloating, maybe refer to that section in the booklet. Um, and you know, there's even things that might not even be specific to cholangiocarcinoma like hormones, those can cause issues with bloating as well. So um, lots of different things there. Should alcohol be avoided with cholangiocarcinoma and does alcohol promote or encourage cancer in the liver? Yeah, that's a good question. So currently there's guidelines for alcohol intake. And I would also just kind of preface these guidelines by saying, again, talk to your medical professional, your doctor about this. Um, I have had some patients where doctors have encouraged patients to not drink at all during treatment. So, um, you know, there, I think there's different schools of thought on this. As far as the recommendations that are put out for cancer prevention and survivorship, typically it's uh, one drink per day for women, two drinks per Per day for men. So, um, you know, staying under that um, and, and those are serving. So they can vary from things obviously like beer, wine, um, or your hard liquors. But I would say there, that's probably something where you want to talk to your, um, prof your medical professional about that. If you're going through treatment or having surgery, um, there may be restrictions on that. Uh, so, yep, those are the general cancer prevention uh, recommendations to stay under that. But again, some people um, or medical professions prefer you to not have alcohol at all. Right, thank you. Um, those are all the questions we have. So if you have any more that you just didn't think of right now, you can email them to advocacy at curecca.org. Um, and if it's something that we can't answer, um, Whitney, I'll feel free to <laughs> forward it on to you. And that's it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.